because there's another church in Missouri that uses that same picture. So make sure you have the right address. I went through it last night. It's very easy to do. Yeah, yeah, and that's a good point. That you'll also notice that there are two Bethany Christian churches right now that have two separate phone numbers. But the one that you want, again, like Matt said, is that one that's got the zoomed up, zoomed in picture of our logo on it. And it seems to be working out really well. We're encouraged that we can continue to um, represent God and be the church, even at a time like this. So we'll, we're th we are thankful for those that have utilized the traditional methods for giving to the church, just as we are encouraged by those who have already taken advantage of that Givelify app. Again, you can find it on the uh, Apple App Store, and you can even find it on the Google Play Store. What a world that we live in, right? Well, let us take a couple of deep breaths. And let us together prepare our hearts and our minds for worship on this day. And let us begin at that time, let us continue that time together in prayer. Let us pray. Eternally present God, 
You journey with us through wilderness and desert. No matter the circumstances, the signs of your presence are always with us. Sometimes in fire and cloud, sometimes in bread from, from heaven and water from a rock. As we, your people, gather in praise and prayer. Help us to find you in the cross and in the lighted candle. Help us to find you as we read from the Bible and as we hear your good news preached and proclaimed. And above all, help us to find you through Jesus Christ in the breaking of bread and in the sharing of the cup. We wait for you in glad reverence and in expectant awe. Amen. Will you join me now for our call to worship? Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. God is alive. New birth is given. Hope is alive. A new age is dawning. Joy is alive. Death cannot harm us. Love is alive. Redemption is here. We are alive. New life is within us. And the church is alive. God's Spirit is within us. God, God of creation, we praise you. God of revelation, we learn from you. God of resurrection, we come to celebrate you. Hey guys, um, it's Danielle. I can't see you, but I hope you guys can see me. And I am excited to give you a little bit of a children's mes message this week because for a couple weeks we haven't, um, I haven't gotten to do one. So I was kind of missing it and Kyle asked if I would do one. And so I was more than happy um, to reach out and, and um, record a children's message so that you, you kiddos can get a little bit of encouragement from um, all of those things that are going on around us too, okay? Um, I wanted to start off by um, giving you guys a few encouraging words because it's a weird time in our world. It's different. Um, lots of things are changing around us. Things are changing every day. Things are different every day. Um, it's just a weird time. So I wanted to give you a couple of words of encouragement from our faithful Bible, and it's from Deuteronomy chapter 31, verse 6. So I want you to hear these words. Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or terrified because of them. For the word for the Lord your God goes with you. He will never leave or forsake you. So after those encouraging words, we're going to get started on what we would, um, what we're going to talk about this week. And um, it's the week after Easter. So even though it wasn't a traditional Easter for us, we're going to kind of stay on the traditional path. So um, we're going to talk about the book of Believe It or Not by Robert Ripley. And I'm sure you guys have heard of it or maybe have even read it. Um, it's kind of a cool book about a a bunch of things that are just completely unbelievable. Things that are true that you would never believe are true unless you've seen it. So believe it or not. A couple of examples from the book would be um, there was a man named James Cook and he had chickens and he had a chicken who laid a completely perfectly square egg. Now, I've seen a lot of eggs. I'm not a country girl by any means, but I've seen some brown eggs and some normal looking eggs and some spotted eggs, but never in my life have I ever seen a square egg. So I'm pretty sure that I would have to see that in order to believe it. So the next example is a 15 year old from California and she set a record for number of hula hoops 
on her body at the same time. Now, I want you guys to think in your head and guess, how many do you think? How many do you think a 15 year old, how many hula hoops could she have on her body at one time? Now, if you were thinking 20, that would be impressive, although not right. Crazy enough, she had more than 20, even more than 30, even more than 40, even more than 50. She had 68 hula hoops on her body at the same time, spinning, going around and around. Now, I'm pretty sure that I would have to see that in order to believe it. So here's one more that I guarantee you did not know. How big do you think the world's biggest hot dog was? Now, if you said 100 feet, that would be crazy big and a pretty good guess, but not near the right guess. The biggest hot dog ever was 3,000 feet long and it weighed 885 pounds and it took 103 butchers to carry it. Now, I'm pretty sure that is the most unbelievable out of all three of those examples that I gave you. I would definitely have to see that in order to believe it. So those three examples, as you can tell, came from a book filled with things that are hard to believe. They're hard for me to believe, and I'm sure they'd be hard for you to believe unless you've seen it. But you know what? If it's true, it's true. Whether I believe it or not, or whether you believe it or not. If it's true, it's true. So in today's Bible lesson, we're going to talk about what happened after Jesus rose from the grave. So as you know, the Bible tells us that on Sunday, Jesus rose from the grave. And after that, he appeared, and we've talked about this story a lot. He appeared to a group of his disciples, but out of all of those disciples, there was one disciple who was very reluctant. He also was not with them at the time that Jesus appeared to them. When the disciples told him, and his name is Thomas, when they told him that Jesus had appeared to them and that Jesus was alive, Thomas was reluctant to believe it. In fact, he said, I won't believe it until I see it with my own eyes. I want to put the fingers in the nail prints on his hand and place my hand where the spear was thrust into his side. Hmm. About a week later, if you remember this story, about a week later, Thomas saw Jesus and Jesus invited Thomas to touch the wounds in his hand and the, and the wounds on his side And Thomas believed. Jesus said to him, Because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have still believed. A lot of people today won't believe that Jesus really rose from the dead. That he rose from the grave. That's because they haven't seen it haven't seen him with their own eyes but do you know what it's true whether they believe it or not me and you know it's true you and I have never seen Jesus but we believe and we accept him by faith we don't have to see it to believe it
I hope that this message today will give you a little bit of hope that we have to believe. We have to believe. We have to believe, we do believe that Jesus rose that day. And we have to believe that all of these weird times that we're going through right now, one day they'll be over. Things might not be the exact same that they used to be, but it will get better. It will become more normal, but we have to believe. It's what's gonna keep us going to believe that Jesus is there with us always. So I'll take a minute before we say an ending prayer and I want to wish you all well. I hope that you guys are all staying well and healthy and I want you guys to know that I'm praying for you and that um, the Russell family um, is here for any kind of need that any of you guys would need. Just pick up the phone and call or text or some of you know where we live knock on the door and step back six feet and let me know what you need. So with that being said, let us bow our heads and pray. Dear Jesus, thank you that you help us accept faith by faith, that you have risen from the grave and that you are alive. Thank you for giving us what we need to believe. Help us to keep believing even when we don't think we want to. Help us keep believing. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Bye, guys. See, when it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked, I wonder who would lock the doors. Hmm. Hey, honey, yes. why would someone lock the doors? Mommy, can I put my can I put my on? Can I put my jacket on? Can I put my jacket on? Can I put my jacket on? I know why someone would lock the door. Let's hear about another locked door in scripture. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jews. Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven. They are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. But Thomas, who was called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the mark of his nails in his hands, and put my finger in the mark of the nails, and my hand in his side, I will not believe. A week later, the disciples were again in the house, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them, and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here, and see my hands. Reach out your hand, and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. 
Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing you may have life in his name. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. I think we have a new understanding and appreciation for locked doors in this time that we are all experiencing together, this time of social distancing, this time where we are invited to stay behind closed doors out of protection for one another. Jesus' disciples found themselves equally in a closed door and were given this account after, after the those women, those faithful women have reported to the disciples that they have gone to find Jesus and he is not there. They're locked in this room for fear of the religious leaders of their day, the same ones that conspired with Rome to end Jesus's life. It's a challenging situation that we continue to find ourselves in. We're not locked inside for fear of our religious leaders. We're locked inside out of love for our neighbor. And I wonder if this scripture doesn't ring even more truer to us. Now we kind of had some fun earlier talking about uh, the gift it is to be able to leave the house, especially in our case when our children become a little bit more aggressive in their asking of their questions. But I can't help but wonder on this day, I wonder what it was that Thomas was doing. Thomas often gets a bad rap. The, sec the, the title for this section in scripture is even identified uh, most often as Doubting Thomas. The gospel writer John tells us that it was Thomas who, for whatever reason, was beyond those locked doors, who returns, and upon hearing this resurrection account of Jesus, he boldly says to the disciples, are you kidding? Look, it was hard enough to fathom and understand and wrap his head around all of the signs, as John calls them, when Jesus was alive. Now this disciple of Jesus, the one that we call the twin, has just witnessed this one that he stopped everything. He stopped his entire life. He devoted it all to following. And he's just been hung on a tree to die. And then if that's not wild enough, he has this account of people saying that he went to the tomb and or that they went to the tomb and that he wasn't there. So I wonder what Thomas did. I wonder what compelled Thomas to leave the safety and security of that room. Perhaps he was just trying to, to step out for a moment to get a, bit of, get a bit of fresh air. Perhaps he was outside trying to continue to wrap his head around the, the last week that he had experienced Jesus. Perhaps he was just trying to find some understanding of what he should do next. In a grief observed, C.S. Lewis writes the following. You can't see anything properly while your eyes are blurred with tears. I wonder if Thomas was simply trying to grieve. You know, we all go through the process of grief in different ways. We go through stages or, or we go through challenging ways to try and filter those emotions that we don't know. I wonder if Thomas was simply trying to do that as well. And we look back on Thomas's actions with these eyes of discernment and identify Thomas 
is doubting. You know, I think of all of the disciples in John's account, I think Thomas is the farthest from doubting. He's just trying to figure out what comes next. And so perhaps after regaining some of his composure, after trying to, to wrap his head around all that had happened and occurred, he finally gets up enough strength, enough courage to go back and to be in the same room with those disciples. And the first thing according to John, that he is told is this account that Jesus was with him. And I think it's at that point that, that Thomas has had enough. He's had enough signs. He's had enough heartbreak. He's had enough experiences that have rocked him to his core. And so he says what I think a lot of us would say in that situation. I have faith in God. I loved Jesus, but I can't take any more of this. And it's at that moment that Jesus appears to Thomas and says to him, peace be with you. Peace be with you. He doesn't appear to Thomas and say, what are you doing? I told you this was a part of the plan all the time. He doesn't go out and say to Thomas, what in the world were you doing when I was here before? He doesn't go to Thomas and say, oh, I'm glad you decided to show back up. Now, the first words that he says to Thomas are words of peace. I find hope and strength in those words. Because it reminds me that in those moments of struggle, in those moments of challenge, in those moments when it feels like everything is no longer the same. Jesus, too, speaks to us words of peace. That's a powerful statement in this first Sunday after Easter. A Sunday where we, too, might continue to struggle with the implications of an empty tomb. A Sunday where we too might be a lot closer to Thomas than those other disciples. A Sunday where we find ourselves asking those same questions. And yet Jesus speaks a word of peace. Because that's exactly what Thomas needed in that time. He didn't need a lecture. He didn't need a treatise on the theological ramifications for accepting his right belief. He needed the one that he gave his life up for to say to him again, peace. Let that sink in for a little C.S. Lewis has some other words of wisdom that he wrote in an article on obstinacy and belief in the world's last night and other essays. Underneath the section titled, Do Not Doubt, But Believe, Lewis writes this. When you are asked for trust, you may give it or withhold it. It is senseless to say that you will trust if you are given demonstrative certainty. There would be no room for trust if demonstration was given. When demonstration is given, what will be left will be simply the sort of relation which results from having trusted or not having trusted before it was given. Then he goes on to say, 
the saying, blessed are those who have not seen and have believed, has nothing to do with our original assent to the Christian propositions. It was not addressed to a philosopher inquiring whether God exists. It was addressed to a man who already believed that, who already had long acquaintances with a particular person, and evidence that that person could do very odd things. And who then refused to believe one odd thing more? Often predicted by that person and vouched for by all of his closest friends. It's a rebuke not to skepticism in the philosophic sense, but to the psychological quality of being suspicious. It says, in effect, you should have known me better. There are cases between man and man where we should all, in our own different way, bless those who have not seen and have believed. Our relation to those who trusted us only after we were proven innocent in a court cannot be the same as our rela relation to those who trusted us all along. I don't think this passage has much to do with doubt at all, but it has everything to do with trust. And at the end of the day, it's Jesus' trust in his disciples. And it's Thomas' trust in Jesus that wins out. John, in a way, wraps up his gospel by saying there are more things that are included in this book but not recorded. Not so that you'll have hard evidential proof so that you might experience the gift of true faith. A faith that says in the midst of challenging situations, I believe. A faith that says, I trust wherever it is that we are headed next. Now to be sure, sometimes, all the time, that faith is an ongoing process. But we've been given examples of that in countless times throughout all of our holy scriptures. Our faith in Jesus Christ, our faith in the ability of God to raise Jesus from the dead. Our faith in the understanding that death isn't the end doesn't have anything to do with what we have seen. It has everything to do with trusting that when we are in that same boat, just like Thomas was, that God, through Jesus Christ, will find a way to speak to us. Doubting Thomas? No. What about honest Thomas? Or Thomas, the one who did what the entire room didn't have the courage to say. But doubt? No. Not doubt. I thank God this day for those like Thomas who continue to wrestle and to struggle with their faith. Oh, because it's in that wrestling and that struggling. It's in that challenge, and it's even in the midst of those moments of doubt. For Jesus again speaks peace to us. I hope that on that day, on this day, that those words from Jesus continue to bring you a sense of comfort and of peace. Because that's what our faith compels us to believe. And it's that faith that will see us through to the other side of this. The 
beyond locked doors, beyond doubt, and into those everlasting arms of the one that we call Christ Jesus, our Lord. Friends, peace be with you. together this day by looking to the prayers of the people. Our prayer today is written from a collection of prayers pulled from the Vanderbilt Divinity Library. It begins in this way, sisters and brothers in Christ, God invites us to bring our doubts and our fears, our joys and our concerns our petitions and praise, and offer them for the earth and all its creatures. So you are invited in this space to say aloud the petitions and prayers that are on your heart this day. O Holy One, receive these prayers and transform us through them, that we may have eyes to see and hearts to understand not only what you do on our behalf, but what you call us to do so that your realm will come to fruition in glory. Alleluia. Amen. As we continue our time together this morning, we turn now to the sharing of this table. A table that reminds us that even in the midst of the challenges of our lives, in those moments of doubt, in those moments of struggle, just as in those moments of understanding and celebration, you are with us inviting us to this feast, breaking bread, reminding us that in its brokenness we are made whole, and sharing the cup, reminding us that in its outpouring we too become filled up, because that's what this table represents for us. It's the continuing and ongoing encouragement that even in that brokenness of the world, God brings healing. That even in the midst of the challenge where it feels as though there's not enough, God's abundance is poured out for us. So know, know that no matter where you are watching this, no matter what you are feeling or experiencing or struggling with, no matter what it is that you are celebrating, you have a place at this table. You are welcome in all of your humanness. So friends, come, because the table is set, the meal is ready. It's that meal that we continue to remember every time that we gather together. A meal where Jesus once took a loaf of bread that was on the table and he blessed it and he broke it. And he gave it to those he was with saying, take and eat. For this is my body, that which is broken for you. And then in the same way, after the supper, after equally giving thanks for it, he gave him the cup. And he said, take and drink from this cup, all of you. For this cup represents a new covenant, that which is poured out for you and for the many, for the forgiveness and for the remission of sins. You see, as often as we eat this bread and drink from this cup, we proclaim the life and the death and our new life in Christ Jesus, our Lord, until that day when he comes again. 
Brothers and sisters, will you pray with me? Holy God, we give you thanks that you are a God who loves us through every bit of challenge and struggle. That you help to remind us that you are with us even behind locked doors. That you find a way to reach out to us when we need your presence in our lives the most. That you are a God who continues to be made known to us in the breaking of the bread and in the sharing of the cup. So we but humbly ask, O Holy One, that this bread be a nourishment to our bodies. That this cup replenish whatever it is and wherever it is that we feel lacking so that we can continue to do the work that you are calling us to do. God, on this second Sunday of Easter, we give you thanks for the action that you took to raise Jesus from the grave. We give you thanks for these elements just as we give you thanks for what they represent to us now and what they will continue to represent to us in the days to come. Alleluia. Amen. So as you are able, I invite you to take whatever it is that represents the bread of life, And then equally, I invite you to receive whatever it is that represents the cup of new beginnings. You see, friends, these truly are the gifts of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. I now invite you to join with me in the saying of the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Let us now bless these tithes and offerings that we have received throughout the week. Will you pray with me? Wonderful Amazing God, we thank you that you have raised Jesus Christ from the dead, bringing us the promise of new life. With the dawning of this new day, may we awake to new opportunities to love and to serve you and to witness to Christ, whom you have raised. Use us and our gifts to your glory. In Jesus' name. We pray, Amen. Give thanks with a grateful heart. Give thanks with a holy heart. Give thanks because He's given Jesus Christ.
friends in Christ, before we close, may you hear these words of blessing. May you continue to receive this blessed promise of Easter. Every night shall be broken by dawn, and every tear shall spring from joy, and every step shall become a dance, and every word, every word shall carry a song. Go in peace. Amen. Yeah.